Oh, okay. So am I like allowed to start now? Okay. All right. Why are you still talking? Okay, so my director was Christopher Nolan. All right. All right, so there's the man. So he was born on July 30th, 1970 in London, England. So you know he's a British American director. He has a BA in English literature and I think this is one of the main reasons why he has a writer credit for all of his main films except for Insomnia, which was also a remake of a 1997 Norwegian film, so not so much writing it did there on his part, but for all of his other movies, even the ones adapted from other books, he's always credited as a writer and a main writer. And he also writes a lot with his brother, Jonathan Nolan, which we'll get more into that later, but he he really works with a lot of the same people on his production staff, the same actors a lot. So he's characterized by, like I told you, frequent collaboration with the same people. And he is known for kind of two different categories of movies, but yet they both fit in with his overall style. So earlier on, he was known for quieter cult favorite movies like Insomnia and Memento and there's a couple others. And more recently, he's gotten into these large blockbusters. And the main theme for all of his movies is that there's something really important about the actions of an individual and accepting those actions. So, right. so some major themes in his works. So like I was telling you just now, the hero will always accept his actions and count on him to do it, especially if it's something unfavorable or unpopular. In Memento, I, um, there's a really great line in there that says, do I lie to myself to be happy? In your case, yes, I will. There's a blank line in there because it says a character's name, and if you haven't seen the movie, you would kill me right now if I told you the name of the character involved in that line. Also, towards the end, or towards the middle of, dark, of the Dark Knight, actually, there's a line that is, you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become a villain. And what happens at the end of the Dark Knight, if those of you who have seen it know, is that Batman will completely acknowledge the moral blurriness of his actions, and he will take upon all the wrong actions that others have done for himself, which shows you that he's willing to accept his choices and the choices of others and do what he thinks is right by the rest of the world in his own moral code. And other major themes are the idea of memory, cognition, and the structure of the mind. And a really notable example of this is from his early work, which is a short film called Doodlebug, which he released in 1997. So the premise of Doodlebug is that there is a man who is, it's a black and white film, and it, there's like a very ratty looking kind of He's like very dirty looking man in a ratty apartment, like one room apartment. And he is trying to kill this bug that he keeps hearing scurrying around on the floor. And the twist that proves to you that it's a Nolan movie is that the bug he is actually trying to hit is really a miniature version of the, of the main character himself. So it's just an entire paradox of there will be a lar the larger character trying to hit the smaller version of himself with a slipper. And then there, that smaller one will be trying to hit another smaller one, and it continues on. So at the end, when he does, when the main character finally is able to hit the bug with the shoe, he gets crushed by a larger version of himself seconds later, which shows you how he likes to create a lot of dimensions and really make you think with the way the mind works and what's real and what's not real in his films. Oh, and he's also a fan of talking about sleeping and dreaming, as you can tell from that picture. Uh, in Inception, which you know was about the dream levels, so that was one of the literal takes he put on this theme. But also in movies like Insomnia, which is sleeplessness, so the, that, comes, that becomes a major theme because it is set in Alaska during a time of year where it is just bright sunlight all the time, so this constant light is re really starts to affect the main character and the way he acts and the way he thinks. And it causes him a lot of mental disturbance. So that's another way you can see that theme manifesting. And also the idea of identity and what makes a hero. Because a lot of times you'll really see an anti-hero as the main character. So the idea of what makes the characters that, that particular char of that particular person still heroic. 
and the idea of control and really more losing control over what you can and can't do. So, huh, skipped a slide. There we go. Okay. So, you see all of these themes start to pull together in the setting and the atmosphere that he creates with his films. So the way he really does that to kind of create a neutral space where you can really focus on what the actors and the characters are doing in the film is he uses a, he uses like a very urban feel to his backgrounds and there's a lot of shades of blue and gray and tan and all these really neutral colors and he's also known for using the straight lines and the rigidity of background structures and background elements to kind of control or tame whatever the setting is that he's working in. So the first notable example I have is in these pictures right here. It's from Memento, which is actually set and, shot and actually shot in Southern California, which is interesting because even though you think of California as a bright, sunny place, still, if you look in the background, you see lots of blues, lots of tans, lots of grays and beiges, and you also see it mirrored in what the main character wears and what some of the other characters wear throughout the movie, and that he wears a tan suit in blue uh, and a blue shirt and also like the cars are blue and everything, so he really likes to tie in that element. All right, so where you can really see this is when he's actually in a city, which is The Dark Knight, which is set in Gotham City, but shot in Chicago. So you, again, get the rigid architecture, you get a lot of black and tan and blues. So some of the areas where you see him using background elements to create those rigid lines are the pillars in the background behind Harvey Dent. Also, if you look at the city skyline behind them, because they're on a rooftop, there's a row of lights that goes right down behind her, which I also thought was really interesting because it's framed up right against where she is. Also, behind the Joker, you can see that there's the diagonal rows of lights from the street lamps that are going backwards. And then when you get to the inside you, of the police station and the interrogation room, you get more of the tans, which is really where a lot of the lighter shades of color comes into play in this movie and the inside areas, and you get the walls and the windows making up those straight lines again. And then you've got the typical example of, how, of framing up a villain and showing the morality with the prison bars right there. And then coloration and backgrounds is really important in Inception and the way he sets up the atmosphere for that movie because I feel that it was a little bit of, uh, he takes his own style but he modifies it to fit the way Inception works because to really distinguish the different levels of the movie. He starts to use some coloration to the scenes that aren't so typical. For example, in level three, you get a lot more of orange and yellows, but it suited what he needed for that particular scene and how to create the distinction for that level, which I think is why he strayed for that. But otherwise, if you look around, level one reality has more of like the tan-based, uh, like really like skin tone-ish feel to it because, well, it was reality. But as you get into the second level with the rain, you get a lot of blue and gray in there. In the fourth level in the snow fortress is obviously a lot of white because of the setting. And then when you get into limbo, again, he takes you back into neutrals with all the collapsing buildings and the sand and everything. It's all gray and tan and beige and those kinds of elements, which shows he will modify his style when he needs to for the purpose of telling the story, but he always sticks to pretty much what he's decided is the way he's going to do uh, in direct films. So thematically relevant lighting is really important. So I mentioned to you earlier that insomnia set in Alaska. So the problem that the character faces is he's trying to figure out whether or not what he's trying to figure out what actually happens. And he faces a moral dilemma. And as his time spent in Alaska goes on and on, the light and the pervasiveness of light, as you see in some of the scenes, that he'll try to he'll pull down the shutters. The first time you see him try to go to sleep, then he'll like tape up the windows, he'll tape around the shutters, trying to, trying to keep out the light. And for me, I thought it meant that there was, there's no shadows and there's no darkness for him to hide his actions or what he's done. And he has to really face all, he has to face the consequences and that's what the pervasiveness of light in that setting was trying to prove, other than the literal idea that if there's light all the time, you can't go to sleep. And then in the Batman trilogy, lighting is also, also plays a huge effect because I think this scene is, this shot is a great illustration of that because you have the Dark Knight, which is Batman. Obviously, he's in black, but also there's not much light on his side. Then you have Harvey Dent, who's supposed to be the White Knight, but ends up being Two-Face, which 
I can't be sure that this is what he was going for, but if you look at the shot, half of his face is in dark and half of it is in light. So when you look at it at first, it seems like the light is on him, like he's the good character. But really, the person who's brightest in this scene is uh, Lieutenant Gordon. And he's actually the best of these three men, morally speaking, in his actions and everything. So I think that's why he's the brightest lit. But when you first look at it, you think, oh, you don't really pay attention to him, I guess, is the way to put it, the first time you watch the scene, because you think, oh, dark night, white night, and that's the end of story. But when you go back and look at it again, you can kind of see the visual elements that he brings in to prove that point. Uh, can you go back yeah. It's also interesting the framing of this shot as well. Um, you have what ends up becoming uh, two faces on the, the left hand side of the screen there with our guest. You've got Batman on the far right. In between them is Gordon. Right? And uh, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the film, but in the end of the film, when Batman makes the decision that he will take all the responsibility of everything that's transpired. Face, Gordon is the vehicle uh, that he uses. Uh, Gordon is the only one that knows that about him. Uh, and so Gordon is situated uh, both physically and uh, mentally between those two characters. He knows things about both characters. Uh, okay. All right. So another. These are some of his main frequent collaborators for his production staff. So there's a real sense of visual unity that hopefully you're starting to see uh, from these shots from all of his movies. And I think a major part of this is that he has a real constancy to his staff and the people that he uses for his productions. So it starts with the film editor. So Dodi Dorn was the editor of Memento and Insomnia, which were his earlier films. And uh, Lee Smith then became the editor for every movie from Batman Begins and beyond that. So all those like really blockbuster major movie styles that started to come out. And then Emma Thomas was his producer for every single film that he did, starting with Memento. She's also his wife. And um, I thought the most important person from all of these was Wally Feister, which is his cinematographer and, is, and has been his cinematographer for every single movie that he's ever done, which means that he understands what Nolan is saying when he writes directions in a script or when he's saying them to him verbally. So he really understands how Nolan's style has evolved over time and he's been able to like, create shots and set up scenes in a way that the same visual elements will, ma will manifest themselves throughout the entire arc of all the films that he directs. And there's so it keeps that constant element to what he does. Okay. Okay. So another part of the reason that Nolan has been so revered by his fa the fans of his really more recent blockbuster movies is the idea that he doesn't really use CGI very often. If he has to bend the world in half, well then, like he does in Inception, well then obviously that creates a problem with filming. So that was one instance where he had to use CGI. But other than that, and you see the major battle sequences and fight sequences and the Dark Knight especially, those are all actual stunts that are done by people. That's Christian Bell stunt double right there, all shot, all real vehicles and everything like that. Even the zero gravity fight scene in Inception was done without the use of CGI. So talk a little bit more about that. So for those of you who don't remember, there's a picture from the middle of that fight scene, which created a lot of buzz when the movie first came out and still does. So Wally Feister, who was the cinematographer I was telling you about, explained in an interview that they would use these massive rotating sets that were on 360 degree, like, I don't know how to say it, but they were on, not really dollies, but they were on like a rotating device so that they could physically turn the entire set upside down on itself. So they had to, all of these people had to be really very careful when they were filming, but the idea is that he was trying to keep it as natural and as plausible as you can because how can you dispute with a director that something like this couldn't happen when he made it happen without the use of any special effects. All right. Okay. So sound is another really important aspect of Christopher Nolan films. So earlier I was telling you about how there's like a divide between his early films and his later films. So I think a lot of that has to do is the way he uses sound, the way he uses music. Between, and that's the main difference, or it dictates the differences between those two. So for his early work, which is following Memento, Insomnia, and The Prestige, he has music director and composer uh, David Julian, who does all of the scores. So when you listen to those movies, you don't really think about the music as much, I feel, because 
they're more of connecting music, as you see at the bottom. And it's more like, it serves a purpose in that it's almost filler between the dialogues to continue whatever mood was set by what was said in the previous scene or what's about to be said. And so they're all like very quiet, very classically based. You'll get a lot of piano, um, very few, you'll get some stringed instruments, but they won't be used as much as they are in, his, in the later scores. So then we get to his current work, which is all of his movies from Batman Begins and beyond that were done by director and composer Hans Zimmer, which is this guy up here. And also that picture is really important because it was taken at a concert at the beginning of the premiere of Inception, which I think is really telling about the difference in styles because now every time Christopher Nolan releases uh, like a, one of his newer movies, uh, Hans Zimmer is always there to do a live, uh, he does a live show with the scores of music, which means they're really starting to become standalone. So big budget movies, obviously there's probably more money to spend on a larger score, so you're going to get a lot of really dramatic violins, cellos. You'll get uh, synthesized notes a lot. The opening note in The Dark Knight is just a reverberating, I believe it was a C, but it was created electronically. So if you were in an acoustically perfect room, it would just bounce off the walls all around you. So there's like a very urban kind of a very rigid feel to the way his music is now. It's very electronic, but also maintains the drama by using large-scale orchestras to make it happen. And now the music is really prevalent in his scenes. You'll see it building up during dialogue happening. So, oh, okay. And, we'll, and I'll get to that more in the scene that I'll show you. All right, so these are the casts of his four most recent movies. So why do I bring this up? Well, I told you about his production staff staying very constant throughout his work. Another thing that stays constant is the actors and actresses that he uses. So obviously two of these are connected. One of them is the first movie, another one is the sequel. But even beyond that, there's a lot of actors that he uses a lot. Christian Bale, obviously he's Batman, but he was also in The Prestige. Um, Michael Caine is his most frequent acting collaborator. He's been in every single movie that he's done, except for Memento, I believe. And then you have other frequent collaborators like Celian Murphy, who was uh, the Scarecrow in Batman Begins. He has a cameo in The Dark Knight. But then he's also uh, one of the main characters in Inception. And then you see, and also Gary Oldman's another one of those. But you see that he's continuing this theme even beyond those movies because, let's see, one, two, three, four people that were newly added to Nolan cast from Inception are now added to the uh, cast of the, Dark, of the Dark Knight Rises, which is the third movie in the trilogy. So you can see that he really likes to pick out actors and actresses that he knows will carry out the style and the method of uh, conveying the emotions that he wants in his films and the ideals that he wants to promote through his films. All right. Okay. So there's a couple major plot trademarks beyond the obvious ones I've already told you. So first is that there will always be a male protagonist. Don't even question it. It's, there, it's a guy, and he's going to be doing the majority of the work and the storytelling throughout the story. And um, expect this male lead and any other important, major, uh, important male characters to be wearing a suit. And I have some ideas as to why that is, which... Um, uh, Christopher Nolan, this, well, this is a picture of him on the set of, that is, Memento up top, The Prestige, Inception, and The Dark Knight. Uh, there was an interview done with him with, in The Telegraph, and one of the first things that the interviewer writes about is how even though it was like a Sunday, they were meeting up, to, they were meeting up at his house to do something simple, he was already dressed in a sharp suit, and his wife commented that this is the way he goes to work, this is what he always does. If he's on set, he's wearing a suit, as you can see. Um, so kind of the, Christmas, the crispness of his own attire is mimicked in that of his characters. All right. Also, a female is almost always the catalyst for his, for his works, and usually a romantic lead, not necessarily though, and the female will always be either A, dead already, B, she's going to die at some point during the movie, or C, she's going to die in the sequel. So like in Insomnia, if you look at it, 
the death of a girl is what brings uh, the police or the detective up to Alaska in the first place. If you look at the Batman trilogy, the death of his mother and father, so you have the mother figure dying there, but then also the catalyst in the middle of The Dark Knight is the death of Rachel Dawes. If you look at Memento, the catalyst in that movie is the death of the main character's wife. So these are a lot of really, so you can tell that he used a lot of the same ideas in many of his movies. So, okay, there we go. Okay, so the scene that so the scene that I wanted to show you now is, it's been nicknamed the will to act by a lot, well, it's what it's called in the YouTube video anyway. So the background to this is from, it's in Batman Begins, and it's part of the backstory training session that he undergoes. So in my opinion, this is one of, it's a classic Nolan scene, and it's one of his favorite types of scenes to create, which is that there's an overarching dialogue, and it's usually partially in voiceover, that it, and it's explaining one of the central themes or motifs to the movie and one of the main plot lines at the same time. And the editing is usually nonlinear, and it explains various aspects of what the main character needs to learn from somebody, either a mentor or another like uh, supporting character. So the opening is Michael Caine, so Nolan's most frequent collaborator. And so it's a really, really simple introduction to him in this scene. He's framed against a doorway, and then I'll keep stomping throughout, but then when, oh, okay, you know what, just start it and we'll get there. It's not gonna work. There we go. All right, so now you see it's a very young boy, so his innocence is framed up against kind of really kind of bleak and blurry outside area. And what's so important about the scene is, I'm gonna let you guys listen to the dialogue, which is why I'm gonna tell you all this first, but it's that it's mirrored again later in this movie and also in The Dark Knight where in this scene, what's about to happen is the young Bruce Wayne is about to say that he thinks he's responsible for the death of his parents. And what will happen is that uh, Alfred, the butler, will comfort him and say, no, 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 it's no fault of your own. But later on in the trilogy, what's gonna happen is you'll get a similar scene where the grown-up Bruce Wayne will be sitting in his, uh, in his Batman attire with the mask off and he'll be looking out the window of his penthouse and he'll be saying, he'll be saying that um, he thinks it's his fault that Rachel died and what changes is that Alfred says, yes, yes it is. But now there's, so you see the difference in that when you're innocent, he doesn't expect you to take the blame, but as you get, what Christopher Nolan's trying to really get across is that you should take it, and that his characters will always take the, will always take responsibility. So, again, really quickly, in the pattern on the wall, you get the vertical lines going down. So, So now you're going to get into more of the training aspect and into modern day he's reflecting back on this incident. So if you look at the way the lighting is, the background is clearly very bright but the lighting itself on these two characters that you're about to see is rather dark which I think is kind of a symbol of the morally questionable aspect of the training that's going on. All right. So you're getting like an establishing crane shot of the area. Very quickly. Also, you see that the coloration that scene, even though it's bright outside, it's still kind of bleak. The whites are dulled in a way, which is another way that Nolan manages to tame the setting. So even though it's nature, he finds a way to control the coloration, the saturation of color, and m make it down into variables that he's able to uh, kind of modify to satisfy the way that he's filming. All right. I want you to confront it and to face the truth. You know how to fight. 
six men. We could teach you how to engage 600. All right, so you look at, if you look at the scene really quickly, you get really the entire color scheme that Nolan will use for the rest of the movie that takes place in this setting, which you'll get the white, the white over here, the gray is the really, really dark black, and then the kind of bluish gray up here. Also, if you look at the coloration of the person himself, he mimics that entire set of colors still. Also, you get what you're going to get is the idea of justice and what is justice from the dialogue and the exchange that's going to happen between these two. Um, and really start paying attention to the music. There are certain cues I want you guys to kind of listen for a little bit later, but uh, until then. Okay. Really? Okay, 600. You know how to disappear. We can teach you to become truly invisible. Invisible. Abhi! understands that invisibility is a matter of patience and agility. All right. So right here again, you see in the banisters all of these vertical lines coming down in the scenery. And you're also going to get the plausibility behind the action sequences in here, which is how I think it was one of the reasons that his blockbusters do so well, is that all of these fighting and stunt sequences are real. They actually had to work them out. They, and the way he films them is also very real. He's not trying to over dramatize them. It's really, it's a lot of kind of full shots, and when you get closer back to the, uh, them sword fighting on top of the ice, it's back into like a medium shot, as, and it rotates around them the entire time. So, all right. So you get this, you see the medium shot starting to show up, and a full shot. Where's my just surroundings? Jitsu employs explosive powers as weapons or distractions. Theatricality and deception are powerful agents. You must become more than just a man in the mind of your opponent. Who is he? He was a farmer. He tried to take his neighbor's land and became a murderer. Now he's a prisoner. What will happen to him? Justice. Crime cannot be tolerated. Criminals thrive on the indulgence of society's understanding. <laughs> Your parents' death was not your fault. All right. So right here, this is the point where you really need to pay attention to kind of the music that's going on in the background because it really, it's, it sets up markers for where all the important lines in the dialogue are going to show up. So pay attention to the crescendos up to the line, it was your father's, which will be the first drastic change in like the sound and the tempo of the music. Then, um, Will is everything is another very important line that comes in this speech. You'll get another drastic change in music there. And then the final importance of this scene is the line, the will to act, which is really what this scene is, which is what the entire idea of this scene is characterized by. So you'll get a really loud crescendo up to there, and then the music will drop out completely, which is another way of showing you where the importance of the scene lies and the way he's used music. So. so. <coughs> It was your father's.
Okay, so Tim Burton, take two. All right, so um, early life in school. With, oh, Jesus, what happened? What do I do? Cancel. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> What's happening? Oh, God. Okay, all right, all right. So, simmer down. Okay, so um, Tim Burton was born on uh, August 25th, uh, 1958, and uh, he, was, he grew up in Burbank, California. Um, and he was really different from most kids because he didn't like playing outside. He didn't really, really have any friends. He was kind of not social at all, really. And so he stayed inside and liked to watch uh, old horror films, um, like The Brain That Wouldn't Die, and like really crappy stuff like that. And he took note on it, and he tried to reproduce it in his backyard and make his own horror films. Um, yeah, and uh, then he graduated from Burbank High School and went on to California Institution of the Arts um, in Valencia, California. And he graduated in 1979. Um, he went there for animation. So um, he got really lucky because um, right out of school, he uh, got hired by Disney as an animator. And he worked on The Fox and the Hound, um, which he didn't really enjoy because like there's 29, 30 frames per second um, so you're drawing that, and you have to reproduce everything um, in order to make the film come together. And so it's really uh, stren strenuous and uh, annoying, I guess. So he didn't really like that. So he got moved to a uh, concept artist, where you draw out the characters and um, the scenery of basically what the film's going to look like. Um, and he did that for The Black Cauldron and Tron. And um, he also liked to work on his own side projects. Um, like he constantly um, drew pictures and uh, wrote poetry. Um, and uh, he started working on uh, this short film. Uh, it was a stop motion um, with uh, figures made out of clay. Um, so stop motion is where you take like an inanimate object and animate it um, frame by frame. And it was called Vincent, and it's loosely based on his childhood. It's about a kid who's um, really unsocial and kind of sits back. And uh, he really likes Edgar Allan Poe and pretends that he's uh, Vincent Price, who's an actor. Um, and uh, in 1984, he made uh, Frank and Weenie, uh, which was a black and white short film about a boy who loses his dog because um, he gets hit by a car. And he tries to bring it back to life. Um, and everyone in the neighborhood thinks it's an abomination. And they get really ticked off. And they run the dog into um, this little, uh, what is it? It's a mill house, I guess, um, where it's kinda, it kind of follows like Frankenstein lights on fire. And then they try to bring him back to life. And it's a cute little movie. But, um, he showed it to Disney um, because he wanted them to produce it and put it out there um, in film festivals. And they fired him because they thought that um, children wouldn't like it and they wouldn't be able to connect to it. Um, even though the main character is a child and it's kind of it's a playful movie in a dark way. Um, so here's just pictures of um, each of the films. So on the bottom are the films that he worked on at Disney. And on top are the films that he did himself. And just from like the posters and the opening scenes, you can see how different they are. Um, like Fox and the Hound, Tron, Black Cauldron, um, they're all like colorful. And even though the Black Cauldron is kind of like dark and ominous, um, it's still, you can tell it's a child movie. Um, meanwhile, the ones that he did himself are like they're black and white. Um, there's a cat in the corner, um, and there's like a dead tree. And then Frank and Weenie, it's in a graveyard, the opening shot. And it's just really uh, goth <laughs> and different from what Disney had wanted. So um, early films um, in 1985. Um, Tim Burton did Pee-wee's Big Adventure based off the character of Pee-wee Herman because um, the guy whose character it was, he saw Frank and Weenie and he loved it and he wanted um, Tim Burton to make a feature length film of his character. Um, it wasn't the most popular of his films because it was kind of, it was really out there and um, it was like, again, like a playful movie but it wasn't like the sense that everyone thought it was going to be. Um, and there's a lot of different elements in there that were just different from what everyone else in the 80s were doing. Um, and then from there, he went on to do um, Beetlejuice in 1988, um, which is about uh, this couple who are dead. And um, people are moving into their house, and they want to get them out. So they hire this guy named Beetlejuice, who's played by Michael Keaton. And um, there's like all like these different horror elements, but it's not really horror. It's like a comedic horror, almost. Um, and there's like all like these different creatures that are purely Tim Burton based, like they're from his own drawings and such. And um, it's, that's an interesting film. Um, and in 1989, he went on to do Batman with Jack Nicholson and uh, Michael Keaton again. 
Uh, and uh, they introduced the Joker in this. Um, and it was really different from other um, adaptations of Batman because it was more involved in the darkness of um, the villains, really. Like, um, the Joker is captured in this different light, um, whereas opposed to, like, the TV show of Batman had, um, he'd always been, he had been the villain, but he had been more, um, more humorous, almost, and, like, it was still, like, a dark sense of humor, but in Tim Burton's Batman, you really get um, the darker side of him, the villainous aspect of the Joker. Um, and then in um, 1990, uh, he did Edward Scissorhands, where uh, Johnny Depp kind of got his break from 21 Jump Street. Um, this was um, a movie, uh, really one of the first ones, where Tim Burton was both the director, producer, and writer. Um, it was purely from Tim Burton's imagination, from his drawings and from poems that he had written. Um, and he sort of got the idea from his childhood. It's sort of um, his short film, Vincent Meets Frankenweenie, um, along with aspects of uh, his own childhood and what he grew up in in Burbank, which the picture that I had shown for early life in school, that's from uh, Edward Scissorhands, but it's uh, like the houses are all very colorful and there's like cut uh, grass everywhere and everything's like really neat and orderly. And then uh, where Edward Scissorhands resides is this dark, ominous mansion on this hill atop the, uh, atop of the, uh, this mountain in, uh, that overshadows the town. Um, and I imagine that that's what Tim Burton's house when he was younger must have felt like because he was so different from everyone else, um, from all of his friends. And uh, so this movie really captures that aspect of it. Um, his films were both admired and uh, kind of feared for their gothic feel because they were so different from others. Um, and he was well liked um, in the movie industry because um, of his ability to produce um, pretty great movies on a low budget. Um, oh, geez. Um, and then uh, they were different from other films at the time, but they had really relatable characters, um, like especially in Edward Scissorhands, because Edward's really, you think of him to be a monster, but he's a really caring, uh, really caring character, and uh, Johnny Depp really plays that out really well. So some specifics in his films, um, he really likes to incorporate um, differences in lighting along with um, abstract shapes. Um, and like you can see from up here in uh, the shot from Edward Scissorhands, um, this woman, Peg, um, or wait, what's her name, Peg, I think, right? Yeah, she, um, she stumbles on into uh, Edward's mansion because um, she works for Avon and is trying to sell makeup and stuff. And she's never really been up there. Um, so this is when she first enters in. And you can see how everything is like blue almost for, with the lighting. Um, and there's cobwebs everywhere, and there's like this really odd statue covered in dust and cobwebs uh, along the stair rail. And um, like you don't really know what it is, but it's like it strikes the curiosity because the light shines on both um, Peg and the creature on the or the statue on the staircase. Um, and then um, Tim Burton also likes to include flashbacks and reflections through glass and um, shadowing in his films, um, especially in uh, Sweeney Todd. Um, I'll show a clip where there's a lot of shadowing and you, it kind of reveals the inner workings of each character and it goes through different dimensions of them. Um, but with the shadows and uh, the lighting, there's very few colors in Tim Burton films. Like it's almost black and white, even though it's not. Um, but when he does, he uses specific colorations. Like he uses blues, greens, and reds, um, sometimes purples, like there you can see with the Joker. Um, and it's really just to show contrast between characters because like even here, um, like the interesting thing about Batman is how um, he, uh, even though Batman's like the hero, he's still covered in darkness while the Joker is in purple and uh, orange and green and white. And he's still the villain though and it kind of shows like this great contrast between like sure coloration can somewhat describe the, um, the inner workings of a character and their emotions but it, um, it completely contrasts who they actually are uh, based off their actions. Um, he, uh, another interesting thing about his films are that he usually likes to show the entire domain of the film in the first few minutes and he usually does this through a pan to the right. So in um, Edward Scissorhands they open up with um, you see this wall and then it pans to the right um, in this odd angle and then it ends up at a door. And you kind of get, um, the door opens up and you see this old woman 
talking to her granddaughter in uh, bed uh, about the story of Edward Scissorhands. And uh, you kind of get the feel that like you don't really know what's happening, but you know that there's like this caring aspect to it because um, the room's like all dark and um, it's like brick and then the doors kind of, it creaks open. Um, so even though it's like a dark feel, like you get the sense that there's caring emotions in there because of the grandmother um, who's talking to her uh, grandchild. And then um, in Sweeney Todd, for instance, there's, um, you see this boat that Sweeney Todd is on and it pans to the right and you see um, the bow is the main focus, but in the background there's London and it's all dark and dingy and there's smoke everywhere and um, there's very few lights on and you get the feel that London is this incredibly dark place, um, especially in the 1800s. Um, let's see, so just a few shots. Um, yeah, should I like switch back and forth between here if I'm gonna like talk about, okay. All right, so, um, the alignment of the shot is kind of interesting, even though it's kind of blurry. Uh, you can see that everyone here is kind of in dark grays, except for um, Adolfo Pirelli here, who is um, a barber who challenges Sweeney Todd to like this barber contest, sort of, um, for honor. Um, and Pirelli is in this blue, and he has his, um, his customer draped in uh, colors of the Italian flag. And um, even though he's the most he's the brightest person there in terms of um, what he's wearing. You can see that um, the stage is set in this corner of a street and everything kind of leads straight to Sweeney Todd. Um, so even though uh, Pirelli is the brightest thing, that's not really what you're focusing on. Um, um, and then the stage here is um, aligned through the pillars uh, straight in the middle of it, um, just to kind of line up everyone. And then Um, here in uh, this shot of Sweeney Todd, um, you can't really see it that well, but he's holding a, uh, a barber's knife blade. Um, and the, I think it's interesting because the blade's pointed towards him. It could be pointed away, but it's not. And um, if uh, in the sh this image is kind of blurry, but in a better shot, um, there you see his reflection. And I think it kind of foreshadows, um, not to give anything away, but Sweeney Todd's death in the end, because it's pointing towards him, not, it's not pointing towards um, this is love it in the background. It's pointing directly at his face. Um, so it's both he's like obsessed with the blade, but it's kind of his downfall in the end. Like he's killed by his own weapon um, through his own madness. And um, you can notice that the eyes here on both characters are incredibly dark. So even though they're alive, it's almost like they're dead. They're pale, and um, they're only wearing black besides a few bunches of red here um, on Mrs. Lovett. And uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> Um, this is a um, fantasy sequence of what Mrs. Lovett wants to um, have her future be with Sweeney Todd in one point. And um, I think it's interesting because of the suit that Sweeney Todd's wearing. It's like a bathing suit almost because they're at the beach. And um, they're like bars, so he's kind of like a prisoner almost. Like he doesn't have much say in his future. This is just what she wants it to be. And you notice that the coloration is completely different from this. And this is a fantasy sequence. Like this isn't going to happen, but this is what they want to happen. They want there to be bright colors in their lives. They want to be on the beach. Um, you know, there's no cloud. Um, there are clouds, but it's not like a dark, ominous sky. It's all bright and happy. Um, so that's contrast that he likes to use. Um, this is just, again, framing. Um, you can see that there's kind of like a grid in the background from the windows. Um, this is from Corpse Bride, uh, which was a, a stop motion film that Tim Burton did. And um, uh, yeah, the uh, priest here just kind of lines up well with every line. His staff is directly in the center of uh, these windows, and then the cups are here, um, and he's right in the center of it. Um, yeah. um, again, from Corpse Bride, um, the whole idea between it is that um, the main character here, Victor, is supposed to marry this woman. Um, and he kind of freaks out and runs away because he thinks that he's going to forget his vows. And so he's um, reciting them to like this tree. And he puts a ring on it. And the tree limb kind of turns out to be the hand of this dead woman. Um, and so she gets fooled into thinking that he's actually going to marry her when he's not. And, um, but then in the end, he kind of falls in love with her and forgets all about the land of the living because he's dragged to the land of the dead. And um, everyone in the land of the living doesn't want him to be uh, married to a dead woman because he would do that. Um, but here you can see that the focus is purely on them. It's not on anyone in the background. Um, I think they're in a church here. Um, and so it's kind of just like 
the present matters, and uh, along with the future, the past and what other people think uh, has nothing to do with their intentions in life. And um, if you notice, Victor here is all dark and gloomy again, dark around the eyes, and okay, <laughs> no problem. Uh, how do I get back? Just hit. Oh boy. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, um, but anyway, so he's kind of dark and um, gloomy, even though he's alive. And um, the corpse bride here, even though she's clearly dead, there's like rib cages sticking out there. Um, she's blue and more colored, and you notice that in the differences between the land of the living and the land of the dead. Um, that there's complete color contrast. The land of the living is just like Victor here. It's all dark, and there's clouds everywhere. And in the land of the dead, everyone's kind of bright and happy because they have the freedom to do whatever they want now. They have all the time in the world. And um, in the next image, which I'll show, um, everyone's dead, but they all have a smile on their faces, and um, like here and here. And um, like they're skeletons, but they have um, reds and blues and uh, purples and pinks and uh, such and gold in there. And it's just a different, it's a completely different world from the land of the living because they're more free and they're happy about that. Um, just real quick from Edward Scissorhands, um, I think it's interesting this shot because the roof here is angled and you kind of notice, like you can't really tell that they're like scissors, but you know something's kind of off about this character. Um, and I think that like the angling and the alignment of the roofing here just kind of puts that off. Um, like there's holes in the roof and there's not much light coming through, so you kind of figure out that there's something askew here, but you're not really sure what it is. Um, again, from Edward Scissorhands. Um, this is Edward's creation, almost, so he's half of a man. There's kind of limbs around here. And um, if you notice, the wall kind of points in on him. And on either side, there's um, random body parts here. And then there's cages along here and books here. So it's kind of like he's not done. So I kind of took the cages to mean that like he's, um, he's almost a prisoner because he can't really think for himself yet. And then the books kind of symbolize like man, like what he's going to become um, because he's essentially going to become a man, although he's not finished yet. Um, and I think that's an interesting composition of the shot. Um, and uh, I think this is the last one I have. But um, just from uh, Edward Scissorhands, again, there's um, this really dark, dingy mansion here uh, where Edward resides. And um, there's all these happy creatures. There's like a serpent there and an elk here. and um, right in the center there's this hand and the angle from the house kind of goes straight to that so you're not really certain what the hand symbolizes but it's there um, and there's all like these bright flowers everywhere and you kind of wonder why is this with this mansion why is the lawn taken um, care of so well and the house is kind of decrepit and falling apart so it's a nice contrast um, oh, I lied um, this is just from Sleepy Hollow um, with uh, Ichabod's arrival into the town of Sleepy Hollow. Um, everyone kind of knows the story, I'm guessing, of the Headless Horseman um, and such. So um, here's Ichabod, and you can't really see him. He's kind of lost in the darkness. But um, the town is um, really kind of whitewashed, or not whitewashed, but it's, um, again, it's almost like in black and white, although it's not. Um, everything's kind of cloudy in the background. There's sheep over here. and. Uh, there's the church, which is kind of like the largest thing there. It kind of overshadows the rest of the town, showing that um, these are clearly people of God. Um, they kind of follow um, the Bible to its fullest meaning. And um, if you notice, there's like no one really in the streets, but there's like a lot of graves here. And so the dead kind of um, overshadow the living in this scene. Uh, so the films themselves, they... Um, they're generally fantasies, but some are action adventure like Batman. Um, and some are dramas, comedies, or musicals um, like Corpse Bride and Sweeney Todd were musicals. Um, fantasy, um, Edward Scissorhands, and uh, most of his other films fall into that category. Um, and then uh, they generally revolve around characters that feel out of place or uh, out of touch with the world. Um, like Edward Scissorhands is different from everyone else. And, he can't really connect with anyone. Um, Sweeney Todd's kind of out for revenge, and he's been in prison for 15 years. And so he's kind of lost touch with his family because um, his wife, he believes, is to be dead, and his daughter's missing. And um, so he's out of touch in that sense. Um, 
Victor in uh, Corpse Bride, he uh, wants to marry a dead girl. And everyone's kind of like, oh, why would you do that? That's not the right thing to do. So um, he feels out of place there. Um, and other films of his usually have that theme. Um, his films are unique and use specific coloration. Um, and they consist of contrast, as I showed. And um, he experiments with a lot of different film techniques, which I'll get into. Um, his impact on cinema. Um, he was one of the first to really create like a comic book world, especially in Batman, with the specific use of colors. Um, uh, like here, you have the Joker with uh, all this money in his hands. And um, you could see the use of reds and blues and oranges and purples and stuff. And just it's like nothing really matches, but that's kind of the point. Because um, he's kind of like an offset character. He's insane and whatnot. Um, and it was used in Batman and Batman Returns. And um, it's been mimicked countless times, um, especially in Daredevil um, in 2003, I think. They like to use the black and white aspect. And then Daredevil kind of stands out of the world because he's in all red. And um, yeah. Um, Alice in Wonderland um, specifically used uh, unique CGI effects that have rarely been used. They were used in Beowulf, um, I think. Um, you kind of, like, they film the person in um, a green screen, uh, in front of a green screen, and everything's just kind of decked out in green. And then you animate over them. Um, so, like, the Red Queen, um, who's played by Helena Bonham Carter, has, like, this enormous head. Um, and they didn't do that with, um, they didn't, like, put a mask on or anything. They just simply animate over them. And um, there's a lot of animals that talk in Alice in Wonderland. And um, they just kind of used um, dolls covered in green, and then they animated over that. And, um, yeah. uh, uh, let's see, his films um, are unique from, and different from all others, because of, especially because they come from drawings that um, Tim Burton did, most of them anyway. Um, and they're all from his imagination, which is all kind of based off his askew childhood. Um, and then he's one of the few to still use stop motion. It's a really rare art form. There's few who do it. And you can see him sitting here with all of his characters from Corpse Bride. Um, uh, frequently used persons. Um, Johnny Depp is the actor that he chooses to use a lot. He was in, um, you can see from this picture, he's been in a lot of films. He was used in uh, Ed Wood, Sleepy Hollow, um, Edward Scissorhands, Corpse Bride, Sweeney Todd, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and most recently, Alice in Wonderland. And he's also used in a film Tim Burton's working on now called Dark Shadows, based off of this, um, I think it's 60s or 70s, um, gothic soap opera kind of thing that's going on. Um, he also uses Helen Bonham Carter um, a lot, which isn't really his wife, but they're like together. They live in houses that are right next to each other, and they have two kids together. Um, it's kind of odd. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So this is her here, them together, at the Alice in Wonderland premiere. Um, she was used in um, Big Fish, uh, Sweeney Todd. Um, what else was she used in? She was used in Corpse Bride, uh, and I think one more. I'm blanking. Um, he uses Michael Keaton for Beetlejuice and uh, Batman and Batman Returns. Um, he used Winona Ryder for um, Beetlejuice and uh, Edward Scissorhands. And um, Alan Rickman was used in, um, he was used in Sleepy Hollow. And uh, he, was, he was used in Sleepy Hollow. He was used in Edward Scissorhands. Uh, no, sorry, not Edward Scissorhands. Sleep, um, Sweeney Todd and um, Alice in Wonderland. He played the caterpillar. Um, and then Jack Nicholson is also used. He was used in Mars Attacks, which was kind of like a comedic Tim Burton movie. Didn't do too well. Um, it kind of came out. Oh, around the same time that um, Independence Day came out. So it was kind of taken as a spoof of that, even though it wasn't meant to be that at all. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, Danny, Danny DeVito was used in, um, he was used in Mars Attacks and Big Fish. And Christopher Lee was used in, um, was used in Alice in Wonderland and uh, Alice in Wonderland and Sleepy Hollow, I think. He was a judge. Um, and then Christopher Walken was used in Sleepy Hollow. And uh, I forgot the other movie he was used in. Um, and then Danny Elfman is um, who usually does all the scores for Tim Burton movies, um, especially in um, 
He was used in Corpus Bride, and he was used in uh, Edward Scissorhands, and that kind of set apart um, all other films of that era for the 90s because um, it used specific instruments. There's a lot of flute in there. Um, there's a lot of like whimsical sounds, but they're used in like a really horrific way almost to portray um, different uh, transitions between themes. Uh, and yeah, he hasn't been used recently, but um, he was used in a lot of his earlier films. Uh, most successful films, um, Edward Scissorhands earned 86 million, uh, Batman 411 million, Sleepy Hollow 206, um, Corpus Bride 117 million, um, Sweeney Todd 153, and Alice in Wonderland was the biggest. Um, it earned $1 billion and it's the ninth top grossing film in history and it was the second top grossing film of 2010. But it doesn't really say much about like how good the film was because it was played in IMAX in 3D and so like tickets are really expensive so it doesn't really matter that much because it wasn't really well received by the public generally. Like the makeup was really good and the effects were good but the story itself, like the writing was kind of bad because it fused um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which was the first book of uh, uh, the set, and then it fused um, through The Looking Glass, which is the sequel to um, Alice in Wonderland, and it kind of fuses the two stories together, and it didn't really work well, um, in my opinion, and I think in a lot of others. Um, the films have uh, impacted the world of film through their unique qualities and pertaining the use of colors and lighting, use of specific colors again, and Alice in Wonderland with um, the CGI effects of animating over people and um, makeup. Uh, a lot of Tim Burton films get nominated for makeup because it's so well done, um, especially with the specific use of colors. Like it's usually whites and blacks and the coloration around the eyes is really what sets out his films because the living people usually look dead. Um, yeah, these are just Sleepy Hollow, Corpse Bride, Sweeney Todd, and Alice in Wonderland on the bottom. Um, awards and nominations, Oscar nominations, uh, like his film himself was, uh, Quartz Ride was nominated for Best Animated Feature Film, and that's really all that him or his film were nominated for. Um, again, makeup's usually nominated, but that doesn't really pertain to him alone. Um, Golden Globe nominations, Sweeney Todd was nominated for Best Director, um, and Sweeney Todd was nominated for Best uh, Picture, Musical, or Comedy, and it won for that. And uh, he's also been nominated in many foreign award ceremonies for um, best direction or best, um, best story, best screenplay or something like that. Um, his favorites, um, movies, uh, he really liked old horror films, um, The Brain That Wouldn't Die, Plan 9 from Outer Space, which was done by Ed Wood, which is one of his uh, favorite directors, even though he kind of sucked as a director. But he did a whole movie on Ed Wood's thinking process, really, and how um, it pertained to uh, how he was just so abstract and different from everyone, even though his films were kind of bad. Um, and he also liked The Omega Man, which, um, has anyone seen The Omega Man? No, it's Charlton Heston's film. It's uh, based off I Am Legend, uh, the book, the graphic novel, I think. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it's an interesting take on that movie because like all the uh, zombie vampires, like they all wear sunglasses and because uh, they're all like allergic to the sun and they're like, they really want to eat Charlton Heston and he has all like this technology and it's an interesting take, it's a weird movie. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, Vincent Price is one of uh, Tim Burton's favorite actors. Um, he loves him and that's why I wanted him to narrate Vincent, his short film. Um, and he was also in Edward Scissorhands, he played the inventor. Um, and yeah, he was really, and he really admired um, Vincent Price. As, as an actor. Um, he also liked Orson Welles, who did, um, what did he do? Orson Welles did, uh, what the hell? I'm blanking. What, what am I looking at? Orson Welles. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He did Citizen Kane. Um, he liked the use of, um, well, it wasn't really for his films, really. Um, I mean, it was, but it wasn't. It was also kind of, he liked him for his radio broadcast of War of the Worlds um, and how it kind of caused a mass panic. And uh, he really enjoyed that. He liked the darkness and all of it. Um, but also he liked Citizen Kane because um, the use of like silent films really like it's overacting and you kind of have to like put out, um, you have to put out um, like enormous, um, you have to go through great depths to show um, 
like what you're trying to get at. And Citizen Kane wasn't silent, but it still goes to great depth to show what's happening. Like there's this scene where um, Citizen Kane, his wife or whatever, um, the main character is um, talking with his wife and it kind of shows they're growing apart because like the table grows longer and like you get the sense that they're um, growing apart. But uh, they, uh, they don't really talk about it. It just kind of happens and you, you have to pay attention to that. Um, Tim Burton uh, himself, he made um, films to connect more with people. Like that's why he chose to make films because he knew that um, he was an outcast really. Um, so he wanted to show the world what he was made of. Um, he wanted to show them how different he was and all his ideas and how even though they are different from everything else, you can still relate to them. Um, and they're all very interesting stories. Um, and he also wasn't happy at Disney, which is why he wanted to make his own films. Um, his inspiration for his films um, generally come from his childhood and his artwork. Um, he writes, draws, paints, and makes sculptures. Um, these are a few of his drawings, with the exception of this scene from Vincent. Um, but here's a drawing, an early drawing of Edward Scissorhands. Um, and then here's one, um, I forget the name of it, but yeah, it shows Cupid slinging an arrow into these two people's heads, um, putting them together, and there's hearts coming out of them, showing that they're in love and whatnot. Um, but they're kind of forced into it, I guess. Um, and this is a sculpture based off of a drawing of all these clowns put together. And it was the inspiration for his character um, of the mayor of Halloween Town. Um, even though Nightmare Before Christmas, he didn't direct it, um, it was his story based off of a poem that he wrote while working at Disney. Um, and the mayor has all these different emotions. He switches heads to show that. Um, so these are the different faces of these clowns. And that's how we got the character. Um, this bibliography. Uh, 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 okay, one second. Okay, so um, I'm going to show a scene from uh, Sweeney Todd. Um, it's the third scene, I think, in the movie, and um, not really important, but um, it's the scene um, after Sweeney Todd comes back from being in prison for 15 years, and um, he meets this woman called Mrs. Lovett who has a uh, meat pie emporium in his old barber shop. Um, and this scene really reflects a flashback of what happened to his wife while he was gone. So, uh, yeah, I'll do that. Um, if you notice here, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, the lighting kind of only shows half of his face and then half of um, Mrs. Lovitz as it goes on. Um, kind of shows that they're both kind of hiding something. And um, especially on Sweeney Todd's part, he's just confused. And the lighting kind of reflects the man that he was and the man that he's becoming, if you notice. Um, Right now it takes up about half of his face and then um, as it goes on through the scene, uh, it kind of grows on one end, um, showing the transition of how, um, how much he is changing even just this one scene. Please sit down with me, Buzz. You will run by the shop. Yeah. Time's so hard, would you let it out? Not there. Now I'm going to come here. People think it's haunted. Haunted. Yeah. Um, um, just again with like specific coloring, um, everyone's kind of in black um, and everything's kind of just draped about and it's not really a happy scene. There's like dead flowers over here and um, there's this really weird owl sculpture there. It's kind of just sitting, staring out into the fire um, and yeah, it's all from that part. It kind of zooms in here on Sweeney Todd, um, showing uh, of what he's feeling, his revenge um, and mixed emotions. He doesn't know what to feel at this point. Oh, 
um, it switches here to a flashback. Um, and you notice how much brighter it is than the previous shot. Um, there's all like these yellows and blues and uh, whatnot. And there's um, flowers again here. And, um, but the outside's kind of um, through the window pane. It's um, very cloudy out. And um, at this point, Sweeney Todd had been um, brought out to, um, to prison. And I think that the um, window, it's kind of um, cloudy because the wife doesn't know what to do without her husband. Um, just real quick, I think this is a good scene because um, she's captured in one part of the window and it's kind of a rather large window. Um, and she's in one little corner of it, so I kind of think that it shows that she's um, cornered in this great big world. She's kind of, uh, again, lost without her husband and she's confused by what the judge is trying to do and trying to seduce her almost. And um, yeah, I think that's an interesting framing. <laughs> Here, um, there's like a masquerade ball, and everyone's in masks. And um, I think that the effect that Tim Burton creates with the um, curtains here um, is interesting, because it's kind of like an unfolding effect. Like, it kind of seems to just go on forever, almost, um, especially when the camera moves in, uh, as you'll see. Um, and there's just all these people, and it kind of shows um, how the wife is um, overwhelmed with all the people and all the action that's going on. <laughs> Um, again, um, this is the judge here, um, and he's in a uh, red mask, which I think is interesting because red, um, although it's kind of like a symbol of courage, it can also kind of represent, I think, here, um, and like the devil, like he has um, bad intentions. Um, I mean, like it could have been any colored mask, but uh, they choose to use red, which I think shows um, the judge's bad intentions for the night. <laughs> Um, and this part here is shown through um, a mirror. It's reflected of um, what's happening. And um, as it goes on, it kind of goes with um, the mirrors there, um, kind of showing that like it's kind of replaying over and over almost. Um, like you don't really know what's happening, but um, something's kind of, it's like suspense leading up to what's happening there. <laughs> Um, if you notice where she says that she poisoned herself with arsenic, um, she's staring right at Sweeney Todd, um, and she's positive that that's what happened. Um, and, but here she kind of looks to the side, not looking directly at him, as she has been for the whole scene, kind of showing that she's lying, as you find out later in the movie that she is, um, and that Sweeney Todd's wife is still alive. And again, the, um, the shadowing of Miss Lovett's face kind of shows um, that she's hiding something, that she's keeping him in the dark. 
And um, again here, um, just for the end, um, the light part, um, although it's not, I don't think it's supposed to represent um, like light in like a good sense, but his face is less shadowed than before, kind of showing that one part of him is taking over the other half, um, I think. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much the end of the scene. Not going. Oh, shoot. Wait, and just look at paintings. No. That's on tape now. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, alrighty then. <laughs> um, I did Alfred Hitchcock, the master of suspense. Um, he was born, born in England, and uh, his career as a uh, guy in film started when he was a card illustrator for silent films, which was basically the card that had the words on it after the people said something. Um, so he, ba he started from the very bottom and worked his way up to a director, um, and he learned a lot about everything in filmmaking, like lighting and uh, camera lenses and angles and stuff, um, which helped him a lot in the long run, like making movies later on. It helped the crew because he got stuff done really quickly and his uh, pre-production was pretty good because of that. Um, 1925 was his first completed movie called The Pleasure Garden. Um, I say first completed because he created a lot of other ones but they never actually got finished. Um, this movie really kind of set the basis, the groundwork for what he was uh, later known for, like his uh, tone and style of film. And then in 1926, he created The Lodger, which was um, the basic plot for his most famous films, like um, a uh, innocent man who was accused guilty of something. Um, his first American film was called Rebecca, made in uh, 1940. Um, this set off his American career, by his most famous movies. Um, it was nominated for an Academy Award, too. Um, 1950 through 1960 was his, his prime in movie making. This is where most of his most famous films were created, like uh, Vertigo, Rear Window, Psycho, North by Northwest. Um, two of those movies were nominated for Academy Award. He didn't actually win a lot of Oscars. Um, after this, though, he kind of hit a plateau. His movies didn't really get better, but they, they were still pretty good. Um, Hitchcock liked telling the story with um, the camera, not so much dialogue or um, anything else, really. So he felt that the, the camera should be what the audience sees as the storyline. Um, I don't remember the exact quote, but he said something like, if you can watch the movie silently with no sound and still understand the storyline, then it's a good movie. Um, also, um, he knew how to create suspense by um, giving the, the viewers more knowledge than the characters had so that um, it would create a lot of tension with the, um, the scenes. The characters were all their own special kind of characters. He didn't like cliche characters. Like in, um, in Vertigo, this is just a little small thing. He had bigger things. But um, in Vertigo, he made the blonde actress wear a, a gray suit that she didn't like because it wasn't flattering, I guess. And he said no because it added to her character. And a lot of other, I don't know, blonde characters, I guess, at the time were wearing like colorful things and stuff that made them look good. Um, he liked elements of a story, a storyline that wouldn't actually, they would just move the story along, but they wouldn't actually do anything to the plot really whatsoever. Those are called red herrings. And in 
North by Northwest, it's probably his most famous one, is the whole idea of government secrets. The, the movie is revolved around that whole idea, but the, it doesn't explain it at all. Um, in, uh, what else did I watch? In Rope, it was um, two characters at, at the party were basically Brandon Shaw, the host of the party, was trying to set up two, uh, two of the characters to go out on a date or something. And that, it, it had a couple scenes, uh, if you can call them scenes, um, in, the, in that movie, but it really didn't have anything to do with anything else. Um, he liked creating tension in a, along with his suspense, because that's what he does best. Um, he did this with his sound, um, music, or uh, t characters talking. Like, uh, for example, in Rope, the um, Philip, another main character, was playing the piano, and he was getting more and more nervous about the whole plot of the story, which I'll get to later. But um, he was getting a lot more nervous, and he started playing the keys out of out of tune, and he started talking really uh, kind of more and more nervously. You could see him getting nervous. And his lighting, the same in, in Rope, the lighting kind of got, near the end there was a sign outside that was flashing red and green, and it was flashing through the window so that it was, um, you could see, it basically the whole room was flashing red and green as um, the characters were talking. Was, that was the most tense scene of the whole movie. And in Vertigo, um, all the scenes where the, um, the, the Madeline was being possessed, because she wasn't actually being possessed, but uh, all those scenes, he, the lighting was actually pretty well done. He made all the, the bright, lighter colors kind of blown out or more um, kind of glow as if she was a ghost, which the scenes were trying to show that she was a ghost, but not really. She wasn't actually a ghost. Um, he liked adding humor to his movies a lot, too, because sometimes it actually added tension. Other times it was just to add humor. Um, Tension-wise, I, uh, well, I forgot. Oh yeah, uh, cameos. He put a cameo of himself, the cameos where he was in the film for like a split second. He actually he liked doing that in all of his films. Um, just because, just this one of his famous things that he does. Um, in, like he, he'll just, walk down the street in a like a establishing shot. You just walk right down the street, you'll see him. Um, other times it's really hard to find him. Like he'll be, I think in Psycho, he was in a, a window for like a split second and then he walked away. Um, he felt simple storylines were um, what was needed in a movie because if, if things were really confusing, they wouldn't it would draw from the movie. The character, the audience wouldn't like the movie as much because they would have too much to think about. Um, again, that goes along with his most famous storylines in a lot of his movies, which is innocent man being accused guilty of something. Like in uh, North by Northwest, uh, Cary Grant's character, um, he was just sitting at a table at a restaurant and these guys pull him up from his chair and they take him and they explain that he, they think he's a government spy and that they don't want him to find out what they're doing and they basically interrogate him. But Cary Grant's character is actually very innocent. He has no idea what's going on. Um, and he likes twists a lot. They. Um, it kind of adds complexity to the storyline, but not too much to draw from the movie. It, um, it entertains the audience a lot. In Vertigo, he, that's actually a very complex storyline, actually. Um, he killed off a character you didn't think would be dead, 
and then you realize later on in the movie that they're actually alive. And it was confusing at first, but then after you understand it, it was pretty entertaining. Pre-production was big with Hitchcock. He would spend hours working on every part of the film before anything was ever shot or set up. Um, rope was really, really, um, really big with pre-production because he had to actually plan out like even the, the scenery outside the window. He planned out where the clouds would be in every shot, like the fake clouds and the fake buildings. He planned out all the lighting for every shot, um, camera movements, which I'll get to later. Um, he would actually not even have to watch what was going on on the set to even know if it was going right, because he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew it was going to go right, because he went over it so much. Um, he innovated a lot with his movies. Rope was really, really um, new and different. Uh, it was shot it, like, like it was a play. It was shot one as though it was one continuous scene with hidden cuts along the way. Um, and there was no different shots between It was set up as though the camera was just following the whole movements. There was no shots that was that cut to his face and then cut to this guy's face. It was all it would be a, a smooth pan and then they would back out and show something else. Um, the camera was always moving and it never actually cut anywhere. Um, also in uh, Vertigo, his most um, really famous shot was the, the dolly zoom. Vertigo made that shot famous um, because it looked so odd that nobody was, everyone was shocked after they saw it. It was really very innovative. Um, North by Northwest was a, the, the classic Hitchcock movie. Like I said before, it was a, Cary Grant's character was mistaken as a spy and um, he was actually really innocent throughout the whole movie. Um, I was going to say something here. Let me go back. Shoot, I forgot. Um, Vertigo was based on this book that I'm not going to say the name because it's in French and I'm going to butcher that so much. Um, it's also a suspense. Um, Hitchcock's known for suspenseful movies. It's a very mysterious movie. Um, and I actually thought this was a very complex movie, really different from his, his other ones because it almost went against some of his, some of these things back here, his uh, attributes of his movies, like his um, simple storyline thing. I thought that the storyline was actually really confusing in this one. I didn't understand too much um, what was going on because of the, the red herring. Um, some guys, somebody, to explain this, I have to explain the story. A man wanted um, Jimmy Stewart's character to follow his, his wife around to see what she was doing all day because he thought she was possessed. And then because she was possessed, she decided um, to commit suicide and jump off a bell tower. But then you find out later that she wasn't actually this man's wife and the, the, the man actually pushed his real wife off the bell tower. And I found that to be really confusing and a lot different than um, what, what was said here, the simple storyline thing. And um, also in that movie, because of um, the dialogue was so important with the, the storyline that this was basically ruled out. I thought it was not so good with that. Um, 
I felt that if I did watch it without any sound, I wouldn't have a clue as to what was going on. Um, so the dialogue was really important in that movie. The shots weren't so much, um, except for the dolly zoom, of course, because that really created tension. Um, Rope, I want to spend a little time talking about because it shows his true um, artisticness as a director. It was based on an English play called Rope's End, which the play was based on an actual event in uh, Chicago where two classmates killed their um, other classmate just for the, the heck of it, just for fun, basically, and to see who would uh, come out on top, I guess you could say. Um, it's also a suspenseful movie, um, a mystery, I guess you could say, because one of the characters was kind of snooping around trying to find out what, why um, one of the main characters was so tense the entire time. Um, uh, here's his cameo. He, he actually has two in this one, which is really different or uh, uncommon for his movies. One, he's in the opening credits. He just walks down the street. But um, later on in the movie, he actually, in the background, this is really tiny, so I blew it up. Um, he has a, a neon sign outside that's his famous profile. So they considered that to be a cameo. Um, they actually added this one first, but thought it'd be too easy to spot because it's kind of red and flashing and right in your face. So they added this one too. Um, to explain the rest of it, I have to explain the storyline for this as well. Um, Brandon Shaw and uh, Philip Morgan uh, just two guys living in an apartment, where uh, they strangled their friend and put him in a, a, a chest, a coffin, his coffin, um, just to prove a point of superiority. And um, then they had a party, not because they killed the man, but because they wanted to see if um, the, the, guest, the party guests would um, find the body, just to Brandon felt this would uh, add to the thrill of killing their friend, but uh, gradually throughout the night, Philip was, uh, he got a lot more nervous because they actually um, served dinner on the chest that they put the, their friend in, the, their friend's body in. So Philip got all um, nervous, he got flustered and sweaty, and so to add to the, the thrill of the whole night, Brandon invited their uh, teacher, or former teacher, I think, um, to, uh, that's him, their teacher, um, to come. Because if anyone was going to find the body or suspect anything, it would have been him. So Brandon invited him to create more of a thrill. Um, and so obviously he suspects something and starts questioning Philip about it, and that's the piano scene I talked about before. Um, and then eventually he comes back, um, finds the body, and decides that um, decides to uh, send them to jail. He also decided that he should go to jail because throughout the night they explained that the, their teacher was the one that gave them the idea to. Uh, kill because of superiority. And so um, one of the big themes is um, Nietzsche's, it's a German name, um, idea of superiors and inferiors. That's the um, idea of killing for, for fun and just to prove a point of who's uh, better. Um, it was actually very lively and cheerful, this movie. Um, and that actually created to the suspense of the movie because um, you knew that the entire time um, David, their friend that they killed, was in the chest, in the room the entire time, and it just it created a very dark and kind of demonic atmosphere. Um, Brandon seemed almost uh, sociopathic in his ways, because he, he didn't feel um, as though this was a bad idea at all. He, he had uh, fun doing it, actually. Um, it was actually when translated from the English play, it kind of had some homosexual undertones that they didn't really like in Hollywood. So they kind of 
tried to downplay it as much as possible, but um, they, it kinda, you can still kind of see that in the movie. Um, that doesn't really pertain to the plot, but... Um, and this movie of pre-production was extremely important because, um, like I said before, the entire thing was all pans and dolly shots. There was no cutting in between. Um, and so um, the camera was actually, this is the, I don't know if you can see here, but this is the camera. It's actually, um, if I were to stand up, it'd be at least three feet taller than me. Um, so to plan out how that's going to move around is incredible um, to, to think about before trying to even do anything. Um, and then to move it through doorways was re really an issue. So what they had to do was um, cut the, seat, cut the, the set, um, put it on wheels, and slide it around during the, the shots so that they could dolly through the door and have the camera actually fit because it was so big that it didn't actually fit through the door. Um, and then the crew was really important because they had to move all the scenery around. Um, because the camera needed to move around, they had to move the scenery so that the camera could get by and then um, move it back into the exact position it was in before. Um, it was only actually 10 shots, not scenes, but shots in total. Um, each shot is 10 minutes long, um, or uh, about 10 minutes long, which is one whole roll of film back then. And um, Hitchcock did this to, to keep it looking like a play, um, because it was created from a play. He did it to preserve the play-like attributes. Um, Like I said before, it was um, cut strategically. Like he would pan behind a character's back at the end of the sh the shot. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Uh, I did my presentation on the Cohen brothers, and uh, this is Joel Cohen, and that's Ethan Cohen. Uh, so here we go. Uh, so background, and it is relevant to later in their films. So uh, Joel was born three years earlier than Ethan, and they were born in Minneapolis, uh, which is like comes into play in the movie Fargo. Um, so that's why it's relevant. And Joel went to NYU and uh, for film, and Ethan went to Princeton for psychology. So that also relates into their um, scripts writing. And they're both American and Jewish, and they say that their Jewish heritage does um, influence some of their movies and how they write them. Okay, so um, they're influenced by Stanley Kubrick and Alfred Hitchcock, mostly um, like the kind of crime drama thriller um, and like the dark, like, kind of like the dark genre like that. Uh, they enjoyed comedies as kids uh, from Hollywood in the 50s and 60s, and uh, Joel's favorite movie was Guns of Navarone, I think it's how you pronounce it. Um, and that's just the, uh, yeah, that's a little bit of background. Um, so they were making movies uh, on Super 8 cameras together, so they were even collaborating when they were uh, kids on their movies. Um, their first, like, movie movie was uh, Blood Simple, which was made in 1984. And uh, they're still directing today, and they just came out with a new True Grit for those who saw that they were, that was them. Uh, their films are mostly like dark and quirky uh, with some of like comedic and action. Uh, and they're very uh, like in the film noir uh, genre too. Um, and it's also very indie, like uh, they use small budget, they don't use a big production company. Um, they keep their films, uh, the budget relatively small uh, when they can. and. Uh, most of their movies are violent with killings and kidnappings, uh, like in The Big Lebowski, Fargo, True Grit, and No Country for Old Men. Uh, a lot of, like uh, I know in The Big Lebowski, Fargo, uh, there's kidnappings, and uh, all four movies uh, get violent uh, near the end and in the middle. Uh, so many films have crimes and, the, and botched crimes in Fargo, which you'll see, which I'll explain when we watch the scene. Um, there's. Basically, the whole movie is a crime gone wrong. 
Um, and then in The Big Lebowski, it's um, the main character, the dude Lebowski, gets mixed up in The Big Lebowski. So it's just uh, like it, everything gets botched and kind of in their movies. And uh, we'll talk about that in character analysis. So both the brothers uh, do direct uh, the movies. Joel originally was the main director and Ethan was the producer and that's how it uh, usually is on the credits, uh, previously on the credits and then uh, after the movie The Lady Killers, uh, it was said that both of them directed it. Uh, so they both collaborate on the screenplay and, and the writing. And when they're doing this, they um, like envision how and uh, what the characters are going to do uh, during when the actual movie is being filmed. Uh, so like they, uh, like they want the movie when they film it to be exactly how it is on the script. So they don't like uh, when characters ad-libbing, I read a quote that uh, like if a character ad-libbed, then uh, Joel would say, "Oh, so that ad-lib was great, but could you do it how the script said it?" So they're very um, like by how their own script is, and they want to uh, keep it like as best and to the script as possible. And so they hate uh, seeing their name up on screen. So they they both edit the film, but they use the name Roderick James uh, as kind of like a, a pseudonym. Uh, so they don't have to see their name for editor, screenwriter, producer, uh, stuff like that. So their early films, um, the first 10 years that they were directing, uh, Blood Simple, uh, which is, you can see here, uh, and you can see by the gun it was, you know, another crime uh, movie. Spies Like Us, Raising Arizona, Miller's Crossing, Barton Fink, uh, and The Hudsucker Proxy. Um, so these movies, like, varied in genre. Uh, I know like the Hudsucker Proxy uh, had some humor, Raising Arizona had some humor, and yes, they all do have humor, but like uh, Blood Simple uh, and Miller's Crossing I, I was a, like a gangster movie, so that's more violent than comedic. Um, and they're very, like because of the different genres, they were very experimental uh, throughout these films and uh, very indie, like small budget, uh, kind of doing what they want and don't uh, like follow any Hollywood uh, you know, like big major studios. And uh, they were still well received by uh, movies. And the star of Hudsucker Proxy was uh, Tim Robbins. He was in Shawshank Redemption. You guys know that. Uh, so their middle films, uh, Fargo, The Big Lebowski, you can see here that's Jeff Bridges. He starred in True Grit as well. And then uh, John Goodman, who was in No Country for Old Men. And he's in a, a bunch of uh, Coen Brothers films. Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, here, The Man Who Wasn't There, Intolerable Cruelty, uh, and The Lady Killers. And so um, these are considered like um, some of their best uh, films, Fargo and The Big Lebowski and Oh Brother Where Art Thou, uh, specifically. And um, also, uh, like, they, they recast uh, characters many times, and I'll talk about that more during characters. Um, so there are more recent films, No Country for Old Men in 2007, which won uh, the best picture that year that had uh, Tommy Lee Jones, Javier Bardem, and Josh Brolin. Um, Burn After Reading, 2008, A Serious Man, and The New True Grit. Um, and you can see here by the violence uh, that uh, Jeff Bridges has a gun and Josh Brolin has a gun. And uh, you know here it even says punishment uh, comes one way or another. So it just shows like a the violence of their films and also the darkness of the films because both of the posters are dark and I'll talk about that in lighting too. Um, so their awards, uh, they've won six Academy Awards and three Golden Globe Awards. Um, specifically, you know, here you can see how um, Joel was just named the director until The Lady Killers and then after The Lady Killers it was both of them directing together. So, and you know, True Grit had ten nominations there and no Country for Old Men, and then uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou in Fargo. So all very successful movies. So the, in the box office, True Grit um, made $171 million, which is a lot of money, especially considering that uh, the Coen brothers usually use low budget uh, films and like uh, now with a major studio. Um, and then you can see here Fargo, Raising Arizona, and The Big Lebowski, yes, they're all under uh, 25 million dollars, but they were made in back in like the 80s and 90s. So if you consider like inflation today, it would probably be uh, a lot higher, maybe in like the 70, 70s range. 
Um, so their credit success, No Country for Old Men, is you know that one best picture. So it's probably going to be their best uh, reviewed film overall. And then you can see True Grid and uh, and Fargo are up there too. And The Big Lebowski, uh, in my opinion, uh, I thought it was better than a 79%. And this is because um, I thought like because it's more of a cult film, like. Uh, you have to really kind of like like it and, and be able to relate to it to enjoy the film a lot. Um, and so critics enjoyed like the quick dialogue that they used in the movies. Um, in most of their movies, they usually have one fast talking character. In Fargo, you'll see, actually you won't see, um, Steve Buscemi uh, as a quick talking character. And then uh, like there's a slower character with it. And in The Big Lebowski, that was John Goodman was a quick talking character. And Steve Buscemi was like a slower character. So contributions, um, very successful low budget films uh, with the film noir genre. Uh, and they brought back the crime thrillers like Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, I just realized Matt's not here. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock films. Um, and then they were able to use their own background, like the Minnesota background in Fargo. And um, they really used the stereotypes and the settings from each genre, like, uh, or from each story. And in Fargo, you have uh, the Minnesota, North Dakota accent is very strong. And you'll hear that in the clip. Uh, in Raising Arizona, uh, they have the southern, uh, like Air Southwest accent in, in uh, No Country for Old Men, they have that too. And then uh, in The Big Lebowski, they have like the very uh, lax, hippie-ish Los Angeles attitude. Uh, so their music and sounds, they really use um, <laughs> ominous sounds and uh, music for extended periods of time. Um, and uh, like in Fargo, they have a repeated kind of uh, like single violin or uh, like a one piece like that, uh, just repeating the music. And it, it really sets the scene and foreshadows for the movie because like you have, when you have the dark music, it's going to be uh, like, you know, it's going to be a dark uh, movie. And they use a voiceover to give background and narration. Uh, they started like in The Big Lebowski, they have uh, the cowboy give narration at the beginning and the end. I thought that was very funny, kind of, uh, you yeah. know. And then Carter Burwell uh, was the musical director for most of their movies. Uh, one movie that he did not do was um, Oh Brother Where Art Thou? And that was because they needed um, like kind of more, uh, like a, a more uh, like old, oldish music because they have like, uh, you know, the Soggy Bottom Boys, so they use like the older, uh, forget what kind of music that is, but yeah. Yeah. The, uh, so the lighting, it's very drastic lighting throughout the whole movie. It's its not really like, um, like medium lighting. Uh, Fargo, you have bright reflections off the snow. So here, um, you know, you have the just bland background. Uh, and it's like uh, we said earlier, very geometric. Uh, it's just like there's nothing out there. Um, also, and then uh, here's Francis McDormand and then uh, someone that's been shot in the movie and you can see just how the lighting bounces right off the snow and and even though the characters are a little darker it just focuses the action right on them and then you can uh, the blood is very red and that's the only real color uh, that's in the shot and you'll see more of that in the clip that I show and then in the Big Lebowski it's um, a most a lot of it takes place in a bowling alley and um, even when they're sitting at the bar and the bowling alley is in the background, the light still reflects off the bowling alley and kind of points you towards them. Uh, so characters, here's Jeff Bridges and the Big Lebowski. Um, usually very simple, average people that kind of stumble upon something greater than they are. That was like um, uh, the dude in the Big Lebowski. Uh, it was like he wasn't expect. All he wanted was his rug back, um, and then he kind of he got into the whole kidnapping and money thing. And then Fargo, William H Macy, was just a car salesman, and then he got into the kidnapping. Uh, and then in No Country for Old Men, uh, in the beginning, the character stumbles upon uh, money, and he doesn't. You know, he's not. That's not what he's expecting to find, and then he gets caught up in everything else. Um, and so they include a moral or life lesson in the end of their films, uh, which is revealed uh, by characters. So like um, Frances McDormand in Fargo at the end when they're driving in the police car, she says, you know, life's uh, worth more than just a little bit of money. Uh, and then the cowboy in uh, The Big Lebowski at the end, he kind of just gives a summary to the movie and uh, reflects on the movie. And he has a really good mustache uh, too. So. 
uh, the characters are very stereotypical. You can see uh, he, Jeff Bridges, the dude, is um, he's like a Los Angeles, very lax. And uh, so this is uh, like he's, he just has an undershirt and a sweater on. And uh, like in Fargo, the, with the accent and in the southern movies, and, uh, and you know, they have the accents too. And um, usually in their movies too, they have something circular that kind of reappears, I read. So like in uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, it's uh, George Clooney's pomade. Uh, tin, and then in The Big Lebowski, it's bowling the whole time. Um, so there's that too. Oh wait, no. So now I want to show my clip. You need, yeah. Okay. Sorry for ruining the movie. Oh, but you can see here a more to life than money. It's she shows the lesson. Can I find notes out when I do this about the clip? I can't have my notes? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. I don't know. But they have our homicide. So right away you can see the North Dakota, Minnesota accent with Francis McDormand. And this guy was who? The guy's father the county. Justice account. But we still haven't found Gustafson? And very like, um, it's colorless in the background and like she's in black in the background is very white with just the trees and you'll see that also later in the scene. Um, and it's like, the lighting is from here directly on her so it's very bright, it's not, and then behind her it's dark and so it's not like, um, it's a contrast and that shows like the drastic changes in the light. Sorry, didn't copy Lou. Copy. And lend a guy too? Yeah. Oh, I'm almost back. I'm taking a drive around Moose Lake. Oh, Jerry's loud mouth. Yeah, the loud mouth. So the whole state has it, huh? Guess it's in and lend a guard. Yeah, it's the one who has it everywhere. They don't find them. Captain. And also the last names that they have um, Gustafson, Lundegaard, and she's um, Gunderson, and that's uh, very like. Um, common out in the north, midwest. They, a lot of people have uh, last names like that. There's the car, there's the car! My car, my car, Tan Sierra, Tan Sierra. So also with the color, the she says Tan Sierra, like very plain with the color too, and you can see the house is very plain. So the, the sound that you hear, like um, like with the her crunching on the snow, it's very like um, that's very stands out in the scene. And then in the background, uh, you hear sounds that like uh, foreshadow, and it's also very clear, even though there's no music playing. And um, yeah. And in this, in this scene coming up, or like in this shot coming up, watch how uh, like long they stay on her. It kind of builds up suspense. She uses her facial expression. Okay, so sorry to ruin the movie. Um, here it's uh, another like with color again, and uh, lighting. Everything is very like bland except one thing that stands out is just the red from all the blood from the wood chipper. Um, yeah, so.
and here you have the kind of like frame within a frame to focus on her. And then here you have a frame within a frame kind of um, to focus on him. And then you can see he's dressed in bland colors. And uh, yes, the wood shiver is yellow, but really what you focus on is the red from the blood. And if you hear the music in the background, it's kind of like um, kind of ominous again. Like uh, it's not it's not something that stands out, but when you hear it, it's kind of like odd. <laughs> That's a leg. So the music in the background, like it builds up, and then all of a sudden he turns around and sees her, and then it, it builds up. And you can even see like the red on his shoes is the only thing that stands out in the very white background. And then the red again on his pants. To me, I thought that um, they put a lot of thought and heart into their films. Like I said earlier, how they put so much time into writing the script and they focus a lot of the directing um, while writing uh, their script. And um, they've been nicknamed the two-headed director because um, they, they collaborate on everything. They do everything together. And um, because Ethan like, has, is the psychology major, uh, it puts like, kind of a depth into all their characters as well and then Joel has the, he went to film school so he has the main uh, mind for what should be going on and they want to show uh, the real America so what life is like in, in different places that you wouldn't normally see in a movie so far ago like nobody really makes a movie about Minnesota and North Dakota um, and then uh, No Country for Old Men you have uh, and Raising Arizona you have the Southwest Oh Brother Where Art Thou it's like um, Depression Era Mississippi the Big Lebowski, you have uh, like classic Los Angeles, um, like in the hippier age, and it's not showing like the stars and like um, uh, like uh, glitz of Los Angeles, but it shows like the the poor section and you know like the one thing that he has is his rug, and you know it's <laughs> um, you have to see the movie, um, and yeah, that's that's about it. It's really interesting in the scenes you showed from Fargo, too, um, how there's a lot of uh, camera movement for a reveal. Yeah. It's sort of a really interesting scene because the camera stays on Frances McDonald yeah. for a very long time, following her, and it moves with her. And, and then once you get within eyesight, it switches to an open shoulder. But you also see her perspective, the obscure thing. You really can't see him, the trees are in the way, and then she creeps down and you get a reveal. So the director I <coughs> researched was Steven Spielberg. <coughs> so Steven
Steven Spielberg was <coughs> okay there we go so he started making films at around age 13 and his first film he made was a World War II movie and he was very like he wanted everything to be a certain way and he wanted to use like real planes for it so he took action and he was actually able to use a real plane by like talking to airlines. So that was like big. And then he went to California State University, but because that was his second choice. Originally he wanted to go to the um, Southern California. And then when he went to school, he was able to intern at Universal Studios, which helped him in his career later. <coughs> Universal eventually signed him to four different films that were going to be aired on TV, so not like in the movie theaters, but on television. And he became the youngest film director for them at the time. And then his debut film was Sugarland Express. And after seeing that film, Universal wanted him to direct Jaws. Jaws became a huge hit in the box office and it wound up winning three different Academy Awards, not like for Spiel Spielberg himself, but for best editing, original score and best sound. And throughout it, the sound is very like distinct, like the theme song for Jaws, everybody knows now. And I'll talk more about sound later. But it also made the top grossing films at $471 million. Spielberg has directed 27 films and he still continues directing to this day as well as producing. And those are his films. Some of the famous ones just being Jaws. The Color Purple, Empire of the Sun, Schindler's List, and many more. His most popular films, when it comes to like grossing with money, were Jurassic Park, E.T., Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of Crystal Skull. And he was also one of the America's youngest multimillionaires at the beginning of his career. Being Jewish had a very big impact on Spielberg because when he was young, he did not like being Orthodox. Like he was, he was raised an Orthodox Jew, and his family like was very Orthodox. His grandparents, especially, and as a child, like he didn't like anything about it. And but as he grew up, he began. Okay, so as I was saying, being Jewish had a big impact on him. And a lot of times, like when he was younger, he fully hated being Jewish. Like it was forced upon him and he didn't respect the religion at all. And a lot of times he would just like not even acknowledge it when he was supposed to. But as he grew up, he realized it started impacting him in his life. And he also had to face anti-Semitism and because of this he started realizing more about the religion and then soon became proud of it and it shows in some of his films, one being Schindler's List. So because of his impact being Jewish as a young child, he decided to make Schindler's List, which very clearly talks about the Holocaust and portrays everything that happened in it. And he doesn't just like sit back and like leave out details. Like he goes very graphically into what happened, which in a way to some people could be disturbing, but that's what happened. And that's what he wanted to show, to show exactly what happened. And Schindler's List took home many Academy Awards. It also made a top grossing of $317 million.
Spielberg has many filming techniques. Some of the major shots he uses are like tracking shots. Like often in his movies, he'll like follow a character like in E.T. There's a lot of different tracking shots. And he'll use over the shoulder shots that are very common, as well as using wide lenses, handheld shots, and uncut master shots with varied shots in between. And then with music, he works with almost all of his films with John Williams. And because they work so well together, they, they've like made a relationship where if John Williams picks the music, Spielberg can say, oh, change the pattern to this, or like speed it up. Like he can specify what he wants, like in Jaws the leading up to Jaws coming, that famous track, he was able to work with John Williams hand in hand to choose exactly the way it was. Spielberg doesn't really have a specific genre because he, ca he has done many of them. So like some of the major ones he's done are sci-fi, documentary, drama, action. And for an occurring theme with him is he'll do things that aren't necessarily real, but in time could happen. Like Jurassic Park, that could happen. E.T., that could happen. So that's an occurring theme, not with all of his films, but with a lot of them. And for Spielberg, he was like very high with programming. And he wound up like laying out the grounding for CGI. He didn't like make it himself, but with his work, it like laid out the grounding for it. He's been nominated for 12 Golden Globes and won four different ones. And he won nominated for seven Oscars and won three. And a lot of them being for Schindler's List, Private Ryan, and E.T. And he's also won many, many other awards for it, different movies. These are just some of Spielberg's favorites when it comes to movies, and that's his favorite actor. Some common actors he works with, they're like, his actors vary depending on what type of movie. But a lot of times, like, he's worked with Tom Hanks a few times, and, like, his actors vary. Like, you can go from, say, Empire of the Sun, where he works with Christian Bale, to Catch Me If You Can, where he works with Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks. But some of the actors he does bring back into different movies. And Empire of the Sun is a popular movie of his. It's not necessarily his best known. But in it, and as well as other movies he does, you see the connection between reality versus imagination. And that's shown a lot in Empire of the Sun. Like, in the shot I'm going to be showing, you see that. And also, with color, Spielberg, he'll do different things, like a lot of times, if you're in a certain time, t time frame, and say it's like dark or the depression or something, not that he's done that, but for like the rich people who do bright colors to sign signify like that they're rich, they have money, when the poor would be like dark, in dark colors, like gray and black and white, and color like has a lot to do with it, and he shows this a lot, and the way he like incorporates the music between that, like you'll see, he'll like add music when it's necessary, but also sometimes he'll add it like when it's not, like it will be quiet and some there'll be dialogue above it. But a lot of times the music he chooses, sometimes it will go against what the actual scene's doing but other times it will like flow nicely with it. And that will also be shown in the scene. And 
with Spielberg, he like he's not like a very specific director. Like he's not gonna be like, if this isn't done right, it has to be shot like twenty million times over again. Like as long as he sees what he wants, he'll go on. Like he's not like he does direct very well, but also because he works with other people well, he's able to like get the product he wants without being so directive. And yeah. So for Empire of the Sun, it's basically the reason why it was filmed in Shanghai is Spielberg, part of his family, lived there at one point of his life. And Basically, the movie was made in 1987, and it's about a young English boy who is living in Shanghai, and Shanghai is being attacked, so, and his family is wealthy, so his parents and him try like leaving Shanghai, but in the midway of it, he gets separated from them. So his, his parents are with all the other rich families when he's left alone, and the boy's young, he's like, nine, ten. And the movie did do very well in the United States box office. And it was nominated for a bunch of different awards. And in it, there's, like I said, the coloring is very big in Empire of the Sun, as well as the reality versus imagination. And you'll see that a lot in my f film clip. So notice right away that he's bright while well, the scenery around him is duller. And basically throughout the movie he has this obsession with planes, like he loves planes, everything about them. And basically it's his dream to see one of those. And when he finds it right here, this is like his dream, like he wants to do this. And like that's his little plane that he flew around, yet he's in this actual plane. And as you, I said before, like the music in it is soft and quiet, but at the same time you're not focusing on the music, you're focusing on the boy just in this plane and his reaction to it. And coming up, like, notice how he doesn't notice all the different, like, how the plane's beat up and shot into because he's still stuck in his one little dream world. But coming up, he hits reality, and it's shown very clearly, as well as color. Right here, you see right away his bright colors, orange and red, versus the army colors the military colors, and he goes from his little dream world of flying in a plane to seeing that, oh right, our country's actually under attack. Spielberg also tends to show different viewpoints of certain characters if it's needed.